We like to think we're certain about things, don't we? We like to be absolutely sure, like if, if it's possible, we could say it would, without certainty, stay good weather this morning uh, so that we can do our Easter trail later. We like to say with certainty that we will uh, be doing this or that in the future. But actually, we realise when we think about it for a moment that we live in a world that, that offers us no real certainty, does it? The best laid plans, as they say. I can't be bothered finishing that phrase, but you know it. There's a saying in science, even, that the only certainty is uncertainty. We can be virtually certain, but not 100% certain, even within the realms of science and maths. One mathematician says this, while mathematics is a more exact form than any other science, it's still not 100% exact. We cannot be 100% sure that a mathematical theorem holds. We just have good reasons to believe it. You may be sure then that we can never be certain we might agree on that. There's, there's, there's never a possibility of certainty. But then a philosopher might pose to you this question. How can you be certain that you can never be certain? And so even that throws up the possibility for us of uncertainty in our certainty. And where certainty ends, well, that's where faith and hope begin. And if you've been journeying with us through Lamentations over the last five, six weeks, we've, we've come alongside the suffering community of the Jews because of the invasion of Babylon uh, to Jerusalem and Judah, the southern kingdom. Babylon was the superpower of the day, and now God's people are scattered. Many were slaughtered or starved to death during this 18-month, two-year siege. Others escaped to, to foreign nations like Egypt or Assyria. Most who survived the siege were taken into exile and resettled a thousand miles away in Babylon. And the poorest were left in the city either to tend the farms and the vineyards that were left or, or just to die. They were people of no use. And we've spent this time in Lamentations hearing the poet crying out to God. And crying out to the people. And you might think, okay, well, the last chapter, we're going to end on some certainty here. We're going to have a happy ending. This is the Bible, after all. Surely there's a happy ending. But this chapter, too, ends on uncertainty. The poet has been our guide, and he's spoken out on behalf of the people. And he's encouraged them to express their grief, to progress on their journey of grief. As we've been thinking through Lamentations, we've been thinking about the suffering that we face in our own lives, in our own ways that we can learn to lament as Christians. And so this is what the poet has been doing for the, for the people, for his community. He's been encouraging them. In chapter 2, he said this, Daughter Zion, let your tears run down like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief and your eyes no rest. Arise and cry out in the night. And in Lamentations 3, he says to them, let's examine and probe our ways and turn back to the Lord. Let's lift our hearts and our hands to God in heaven. See how he's encouraging the people. We're going through this terrible tragedy together, the worst tragedy that, that, that the Jews had ever faced up until that point. He says, look, pour out your hearts like water before the Lord. Examine your ways and turn back to him. Lift up your hearts and your hands to him. And now here in the final chapter, this community of exiled Jews speak for themselves. It's like they've finally taken his advice or they finally come to a place in their journey of sorrow where they're able to, to find their own words and to cry out to God. And so we saw Lamentations a little bit like a mountain, we had this big glimpse of hope in chapter 3, but then we made a, a steep descent back into chapter 4 and chapter 5. And yet there are still reasons for hope in today's passage. So we'll come to read it. This is the shortest chapter in Lamentations. It's 22 verses, still like the others, but they're differently paced. They were paced like dirges, like funeral songs. But this one in, in the Hebrew in which it was written has more of a, a slightly upbeat uh, 
upbeat pace to it. And it's not an acrostic, which again, if you care about these things, all our other verse, all our other chapters were acrostics. They took the letters of the Hebrew alphabet and each line followed the next letter of the alphabet. And so there was a pattern. We talked about how that helped the poet put into some kind of order the, the suffering that he and the people were going through. How it was, if you like, an A to Z of suffering. Hebrew alphabet doesn't have Z, but how, it, how it's a complete picture of the suffering of the people. But here in chapter 5, that little pattern is lost. We don't notice that in our English translations. But it might be a sign that there is some hope, some progress, that all this putting this stuff together in order is starting to bear fruit. And so chapter 5 is a prayer from the people's perspective. Father, as we come uh, to read these words, would you speak to us through them? Would you encourage us this morning? Would your word be a blessing to us? And Lord, as we reflect on the suffering of your people and the suffering in our lives, Lord, we also reflect on the suffering of your son, Jesus. May he be glorified through your word for his sake. Amen. Lord, remember what's happened to us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our houses to foreigners. We've become orphans, fatherless, our mothers, uh, our widows. We must pay for the water we drink. Our wood comes at a price. We're closely pursued. We're tired and no one offers us rest. We made a treaty with Egypt and with Assyria to get enough food. Our ancestors sinned. They no longer exist, but we bear their punishment. Slaves rule over us. No one rescues us from them. We secure our food at the risk of our own lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin, it's as hot as an oven from the ravages of hunger. Women have been raped in Zion, virgins in the cities of Judah. Princes have been hung up by their hands. Elders are shown no respect. Young men labor at millstones and boys stumble under loads of wood. The elders have left the city gate. The young men, their music. And so joy has left our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this, our heart is sick. Because of these, our eyes grow dim. Because of Mount Zion, which lies desolate and has jackals prowling in it. You, Lord, are enthroned forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. So why do you continually forget us, abandon us for our entire lives? Lord, bring us back to yourselves so we may return. Renew our days as in former times, unless you have completely rejected us and are intensely angry with us. As we spend a few moments exploring these verses, you notice that uncertain ending. It's not the jolly ending you might have hoped, is it? Let's just be reminded that our purpose in going through this book was to consider for ourselves how we can lament as Christians, as individuals, and as a community, as a church, when things go wrong, when things get hard, when we suffer together. How do we learn to lament as Christians? We've seen over the weeks that there have been four parts to this, and we find all four of these parts in in this chapter. Sometimes you go to a lament in Scripture, and not all these parts are there, or they're in a different order, or some are more there than others, but they're all here in this chapter. And the point is, it's not a science or a magic formula. Here's how you lament, steps one, two, three, four. It's it's a process. It's an expression of the, the feelings and the pain of our hearts. But it will usually include these four elements. You bring your complaint to God. You don't be shy or ashamed or fearful about coming to God and explaining to him exactly what is going on in your life, your hurts, your sufferings, your frustration, your distress, your pain. And then you turn to him. 
maybe turning in repentance if that's what's needed. But you turn to him either way and you call out to him. You remind him who he is, who he has declared himself to be, and you remind him of his promises. And then you choose to trust. Because faith is a choice when it comes to those hard times. And so you choose to trust in him, despite what all the circumstances surrounding you tell you otherwise. And then you ask boldly for what you want to see God do, the change you want to see him bring in those situations. And so as we do this, as we learn to lament as a church, we can come to God with open hearts to learn the lessons that God wants to teach us in our pain, to grasp more deeply the depths of our sin, and so to grasp also the heights of his grace and his love for us. And I think also to be ready to be used by him Sometimes when we suffer or when we struggle or when we're in pain and we think, well, God can't use me then. But through our lament and through our reflection, we discover that that we can be ready to be used by God in profound ways. Many of you perhaps know of Joni Erickson Tada, her story. If not, maybe we'll watch the film or documentary about it one time and learn a bit more about her. Uh, She was uh, raised a Christian and she was a a great athlete and then uh, she misjudged the depth of some water that she uh, dived into and lost uh, the use of her entire body uh, from her neck down. She became uh, paralyzed. And years followed of her struggling, wrestling with God, depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts and questions of faith. How do I, how do I trust and love and believe in a God who would allow this to happen to me? be surprised if none of us have asked that question one way or another at some point. Yet Joni's testimony is one of the faithfulness of God and how God has used her in her suffering. And so we don't discount our suffering and our pain. As Christians, we ask God, how are you going to use me through this? What is this for, Lord? How will this bring you glory? What lessons do you want me to learn? How can I grow closer to you? How can my faith increase? As we lament, we become more and more convinced we need God's mercy day by day. And so let's just see in in this chapter these four things kind of play out. I won't spend long on them at all, but just kind of overview them. Firstly, bringing your complaint And that's kind of what the poet does in these first 16 verses. He says, Lord, remember our suffering. All these things begin with re, by the way. I didn't kind of make it like this, but they're all kind of in the the chapter. Remember, remember your suffering. Verse one, Lord, remember what has happened to us. Look and see our disgrace. As they recount these things, as they make their complaint to God, they're saying, Lord, you, you need to know this. You better remember this. And these verses are so comprehensive. When I read it, I picture one of those post-apocalyptic science fiction films. It just seems like the the devastation and the isolation and uh, and the emptiness of it all. But it's not. It's history and it's real. And so the people say to the Lord, look, remember what's happened to us. Remember with us our inheritance. The land that you promised to us, Lord, has been taken from us by force. Our homes are destroyed. We have nothing. Our livelihoods are gone. That's their land and their property, their family. Everyone knows someone who's lost someone in Jerusalem. Death has visited the holy city. Dead parents leave orphans. Dear children leave brokenhearted parents. Widows and widowers grieve their lost husbands and wives. Even those who survive, who perhaps haven't lost anyone close to them, grieve what could have been. They've lost all their essentials, those things that we just rely on for survival. Your shelter, your food, your drink, your warmth, your community. None of those things can be taken for granted now. They pay for their water. You haven't got cash? You got nothing to drink. They pay for their wood. No money? Well, there's no way to warm yourself. They're sick from starvation. 
They tried to work something out with the neighboring nations, Egypt and Assyria, but nothing really came of that. And so now if they want food, they put their lives at risk. Every time they head out, they're searching for food, they're just as likely to be murdered. This suffering is all embracing. No one is immune from it. The women in the city are assaulted and degraded. The dignitaries and the royals are tortured and executed. The community leaders are left powerless. They're humiliated. Strong young men collapse as they're forced to work at the millstones. Judah's young sons are forced into slave labor. Their joy and their hope and their pleasure are all gone. No more do they dance but they mourn instead. It's all embracing, isn't it? Their land, their property, their families, the essential things they need for survival. doesn't matter whether you're young or old, rich or poor, famous or unknown, all joy, all pleasure is gone. They say, remember, Lord, what we're going through. No one offers us rest in verse 5. We're closely pursued, we're so tired, and no one will help us, no one will give us rest and in verse 8 no one rescues us slaves rule over us now no one will rescue us from them we've looked to the surrounding nations no one has come we've cried out to you lord and you haven't changed the situation remember lord we have no rest we have no rescue and so they bring their complaints to god and you know we can do that as Christians. God's people, in their deep distress, brought their complaints. They laid the facts out as they were. The Lord already knows, doesn't he? He already knew what they were going through. And so too, we have a God who knows what we go through. We have a a saviour who sympathises with us in our weaknesses, in our struggles and temptations, yes, but also in our suffering and our pain and our worry and anxiety. We have a saviour who knows those things. He went through them himself. And so maybe in your suffering, in your pain, you hit a point where you just feel like, I have no rest in my life. And it seems like I've cried out to God, but he's forgotten me. There's no remembrance there. And I remind him of what I'm going through, and yet there is no rescue from my circumstances. And you feel forgotten by God, and you think, well, Lord, what is my purpose? Why are you putting us through this? Well, you can bring your complaints to God today. You can cry out to him in your plight. You can ask him for rest and for rescue. But don't be afraid to do it. Don't feel like God doesn't want to hear it. Don't feel like God would be offended if you lay it out plainly. Bring it to him. Because God's promise for his people, the big promise, is rest, isn't it? and is rescue. It is salvation. So bring it to him. The second thing we see here is, is that the people turn to God. They, they recognize their sin in verse 7. But they, they argue like it's a bit unfair. God, it was our ancestors that sinned, right? And they no longer exist, but we bear their punishment. What's that about, God? But the reality is, if you've been tracking through Lamentations, you'll see each of them are equally responsible. And they acknowledge that in verse 16, don't they? If you see that there, the crown has fallen from our head. Our glory is gone. Woe to us, for we have sinned. They turn to God and just recognize and acknowledge, Lord, it's us. We know that. And you see in verse 17 what what it's done to them as people and as a community. Because of this, because of our sin and because of the ruin we see around us, our heart is sick and our eyes grow dim. This is what suffering does, isn't it? And this is what sin does when we're far from God. It makes our hearts sick. Our eyes grow dim. That's not just, you know... It's not so much an idea of tiredness, it's more the light of life has gone from our eyes. It's as if we're the walking dead because of these things. Our purpose, our life, our joy is all gone, our hearts are broken. And Lord, we recognize this because we have sinned. 
And we heard those verses earlier from Lamentations 2 and 3, where, where the poet says, come on, cry out to God, acknowledge your sin. Arise and, and do this thing. Come back to him. Turn to him. And so that's what, that's what the people start to do here. They recognize their sin and they repent. You can see in verse 21 there, the start of this. Lord, bring us back to yourself so that we may return. We want to come back to you. We want to be close to you again. We want to be where you are. And so for you today, it might be that that the aspect of lament that stands out the most is that you need to turn back to God. That because of sin, or perhaps for some other kind of reason, you've, you've stepped away from God, you've taken a step back from him. And today, the call of this passage, the encouragement for us is to turn back, to turn to him. The third thing is to choose to trust. Ignore my things going in the wrong order. To choose to trust, to remind him of who he is. You see how they do that in verse 19. As a community, they cry out to God. You can look down in verse 19 there. Suddenly, out of all this suffering, they say this. You, Lord, are enthroned forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. You're the eternal God. You had no beginning and no end. You are above all things and you are the one that we cry out to because you revealed yourself to us. And all the way through Lamentations, you realize actually there have been these glimpses of who God is. You are faithful. You promise to be merciful. You are the king who loves righteousness and justice. You are a shepherd. You are holy. You are not cruel or capricious. You have no pleasure in seeing people suffer. You hear the cries of those you love. You see their pain. You act to rescue. This is the story of God and his people all the way through scripture. He sees and he hears and he, cry, he hears our cries and he comes and he rescues. He comes to be amongst his people. So they say, you won't leave us or forsake us. That's not you, Lord. You've shown us enough about yourself. Let us remind you who you say you are. Be true to who you are, Lord. And the challenge in light of that is there in verse 20. I think it is a challenge from the people to God, almost uh, a, a dare. Why do you continually forget us, abandon us for our entire lives? Lord, that doesn't add up with who you say you are. Are you going to keep doing that? Or are you going to respond to our prayers? This is the thing with choosing to trust. In the midst of their pain, they declare to God who he is and they say, Lord, we want to appeal to you and who you are. And enduring suffering for us, that in itself doesn't guarantee us nearness to Jesus, closeness to God. See, we always have a choice to turn and choose to trust. There are two paths we can take when we face suffering. We can be determined to cling to God, to persevere, to be resilient, to want to, to learn and to, to let him teach us through it and to know him more. Or we can choose to let it lead us to bitterness. We choose to trust and cling to him, or we choose a road of bitterness. I've seen many, many people, and perhaps you have too, choose the second road. Not to turn to the Lord and to lean on him because of the pain they're going through, but to blame him instead and to walk away from him because of illness or dissatisfaction with the way their life turned out or difficulties with their children or broken dreams or grief. These terrible things that we encounter in life, they're meant to draw us closer to God. And yet many, many take these experiences of life and use them as opportunities to turn from him. The last thing then that we are encouraged to do and the people do is to ask boldly. If we're going to choose to trust, if we're not going to let our suffering kill our trust in God, then here's what we get to do. We get to ask him to act. We get to ask him to move. We get to do that boldly and we get to do it unashamedly and repeatedly. 
in view of the suffering of the people and their repentance and, and God's unchanging character, they say to God, Lord, we want to return to you. We've read this bit of the verse already. Bring us back to yourselves, Lord. This is our request. You've heard all our complaints. We've chosen to trust in you. Now bring us back. Let us return to you. We want to get back to the land. We want to be your people in your place with your presence. Let us return, Lord. And Lord, renew us. Because we realize that there is something desperately wrong with our hearts. They are sin-sick hearts. So please, renew our days as in former times. The times when, when great King David was our king. And everything seemed right with the world. Your promises were coming to fruition in wonderful and beautiful ways. And so the people, even after all they've been through, will ask boldly. What are, what are you asking God for at the moment? Are you asking God for anything? Have you asked for so long that actually now you've given up asking? Or are you going to keep asking? Yeah, Dyer's reminded us again this morning about Claire and Claire's healing. That didn't come like that from one prayer request. It came from years and years and years of pleading and choosing to trust and waiting, and God has moved. It is hard, I grant you, when you pray and you plead for years and years and it seems that God hasn't moved or that God's answer for you is no. And yet, we get to ask. We get to come to the king of the universe, the one who is enthroned above all, the one who endures from age to age, the one who is eternal. We get to bring our little requests to him and he cares. And so for all of this, the poem, the book ends with deep uncertainty. As I said, it's not a formula or a science experiment that gets our almost certain results. They call out to God, please be consistent, do this for us, unless, verse 22, unless that is, you've completely rejected us and are angry with us. When certainty fades that's when hope and joy and trust need to step in because in the middle of the the chaos that they were going through judah dared to trust the prophetic promise we saw last time at the end of chapter four jerusalem your punishment is complete your exile will come to an end there is this glimpse of certainty but they're not living in it yet they're living in the midst of the chaos and of the uncertainty and I think when God finally answered their prayer fully, he didn't do it in the way they expected. Yes, they got to go back to the land. Yes, they got to rebuild the temple, but it was a shadow of the former temple. And there's never any record of the presence of God coming back. They had no ark. They had nothing. But 600 years after these poems were penned, or nearly 600 years there's a glimpse of that prayer being answered. God came to live amongst his people. Israel's certainty and our certainty is not to be found in ideas or philosophies, but in a person, in a, in a man who was God, Jesus, God's son. You know, Joni, who I mentioned earlier, she says this, God is good not because he gives us answers, but because he gives us himself. God is good, not because he gives us answers, not because every time you pray and ask, you see the answer you want or you get an answer at all that makes sense to you. He is good because he has given you so much more than an answer to a prayer about temporary suffering or temporary pain. He has given you himself. He has given everything. You know, Jesus could have claimed the book of Lamentations for his own. It is his own. It's in his word. It's inspired by his spirit. Let's ponder on Jesus as we come to share the bread and wine in just a moment. You see, the people in this poem say, the crown has fallen from our head. Our glory is gone. And so they wait for this glorious king. Well, what happens to Jesus? The soldiers on that Good Friday stripped him. 
and dressed him in a scarlet robe, and they twisted together a crown of thorns. They didn't put a crown of gold and jewels on his head, but one of thorns, and they pressed it into his head, and they placed a staff in his right hand. The crown has fallen from the people's head, but Jesus himself bore a crown in their place and for them. The people in Lamentations were mocked. They say, all who pass by scornfully clap their hands at us. They, they hiss and they shake their heads at daughter Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? All your enemies open their mouths against you. They hiss and gnash their teeth saying, we've swallowed her up. This is the day that we've waited for. We've lived to see it. That's Judah's enemies. This is the day we've waited for. Well, the day that Jesus went to the cross, the soldiers knelt down before him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. And they spat on him. And they took the staff from his hand and they kept hitting him on the head with it. And after they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and they put his own clothes back on him and led him away to be crucified. But that wasn't the end because Matthew tells us then even just those people who passed by were yelling insults. And just like Judah's enemies were shaking their heads. Even the religious leaders, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, they all mocked Jesus. They said he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God, then let God rescue him now. If he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the criminals next to Jesus, who were crucified with him, mocked him. These are Jesus' laments. All who pass by scorn me. All my enemies open their mouths against me. Israel were, was abandoned and lament their abandonment. Well, what does Jesus say? Well, actually, here's first what they say. Why do you continually forget us? Why do you abandon us for our entire lives? What does Jesus say? Well, he quotes a lament psalm. Even as Jesus is going to the cross and he's working through the psalms in his head and his heart, he's dwelling on the lament psalms. He's lamenting as he goes to the cross. And so he quotes Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and my words of groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you don't answer. By night, yet I have no rest. Matthew tells us from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma samachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why do you continually forget us, abandon us for our entire lives? We heard how the community here in Lamentations 5 felt like they were bearing the consequences of the sins of others. They said, our ancestors sinned, they no longer exist, but we bear their punishment. Even though we saw that really they were responsible too. But in the reading we had earlier from Isaiah 53, we read this. Jesus was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. The crown was placed on his head. He was mocked. He was abandoned. He bore the sins of others Intense anger was placed on him. Again, the community complains, unless you've completely rejected us and are intensely angry with us. Well, isn't that what Jesus endured at the cross? Isaiah again. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, carried our pains. We regarded him stricken and struck down by God, afflicted. We all went astray like sheep. We've all turned to our own way, but the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. And just as the people reflect, we have to pay for the water that we drink. We have no water source anymore. 
Our skin is as hot as an oven from the ravages of thirst and hunger. Well, as he hung on the cross, Matthew tells us in chapter 27, verse 28, after this, Jesus knew that everything was now finished. The scripture might be fulfilled. Sorry, John, John 18, this is. After this, when Jesus knew everything was now finished and the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. Just like the people back then, we have no water. Jesus said, I'm thirsty. And so a jar full of sour wine was sitting there. And they they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and they held it up to Jesus as he hung on the cross. And as he received it, he said, it is finished. Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. You see, all the things that the people went through because of their own sins, their leaders' sins, their ancestors' sins, this catastrophe, the consequences of all this rebellion, the suffering that they go through that finds them eventually crying out to God in prayer. Well, as God's people here on earth today, a community of exiles, we don't pray with uncertainty. We don't end our prayers on a question mark because of the cross, because of what Jesus went through, because these lamentations are his lamentations. At the cross, we see not only has God never forgotten and abandoned his people, but he has remembered us and loved us in eternity. And at the cross, we find we're not abandoned to live out our days in disgrace, but by his grace, we are renewed, receiving new life through the death of Jesus. And at the cross, when we were overcome by sin's power and the devil's schemes, we encounter the one who rescues us when we can't rescue ourselves. And at the cross, we discover that we're not rejected by God in his anger at sin, but in his compassion, he has forgiven us and he has brought us close to himself. Jesus became the way for us to return to God's family that we might share in Christ's inheritance. At the cross, a world ravaged by the consequences of sin can enter into true and lasting rest in the arms of Christ who died for them. We are remembered. We are renewed. We are rescued. We are not rejected. We return into the family of God And so it is then here that the community of God, Bethel, can come and cry out, how long, O Lord? We declare that you are compassionate and righteous and faithful and our merciful King. You are God enthroned forever and we claim all the promises of Calvary. Remember us, renew us, restore us, rescue us. Don't reject us, but draw us close to you. Bring us home and give us rest. Father God, we thank you very much for your word. Every chapter of it, every verse of it, every sentence of it, every word holds something for us today. And Lord, as we as a community at this time even go through some really difficult things, both in our personal lives and and as a whole in in our church family. Lord, we cry out to you and we ask boldly that you would act. Lord, we acknowledge our sin before you. We acknowledge our mistakes, our rebellion. And Lord, we remind you that you are faithful to forgive. You are quick to show mercy. You are full of compassion for your people. And so we thank you, Lord, that we get the privilege of coming to you in prayer as community to cry out to you and seek your face today. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the cross. And Lord, as we uh, share in the meal of bread and the cup in just a moment, Father, would you minister to each one of us as we have need And Lord, would you help us to learn to lament that we might grow as a Christian community together. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.